adventures? Can you hear me? Yeah. Is everyone ready? Okay, so everyone has a, a, a computer that's running the, uh, the um, uh, virtual machine or had it running earlier this week. And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to use that to run a mantle convection model. So, um, so my name is Louise Kellogg, and among one of my hats is that I am the director of an organization called CIG, the Computational Infrastructure for Geodynamics. Uh, CIG was basically uh, formed about 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago now, when a group of uh, geodynamicists got together because uh, our community realized that we were writing codes, investing a lot in writing codes. Oh, I, that was. I took more of them, my fair share of space here. <laughs> That's for you. Yep. So uh, we and so the community realized that there was a lot of effort, and that these some of these codes were then being lost when the the graduate student who wrote the code graduated, and also because uh, they were written by graduate students who were geoscientists as as numerical methods advanced maybe the students didn't always have access to the latest numerical methods. And so CIG was put into place to help basically bring the numerical codes that are used in geophysics up to a higher standard, make sure they're benchmarked, make sure they're tested, make sure they're documented, make sure they're maintained and distributed, and then also to develop new codes. And so, uh, so that's basically what we do. And so we have, a, a, we have some staff and we have some subcontracts to experts who do that, and so some of those have been brought here today. So uh, basically, the, w one of the things we've been doing over the last couple of years is developing a mantle convection code that addresses a problem that previous mantle convection codes weren't designed to address, and that is that uh, as we want to get higher and higher resolution models, um, there's a technique called adaptive mesh refining where you can take the grid, you'll hear what a grid is in a few minutes, and refine it in the places where the geologic action is, so subduction zones and so on. And that way you can put most of the computer power where the computer power is most needed. And so that's the advantage of that. So we're going to use that as our tutorial today. So uh, we have um, several people here who are going to help. So Eric Hyen is the lead um, software developer at CIG. He's here to uh, walk you through the tutorial and get you uh, used to using this. Timo Heister, can you please stand, is at Clemson University. Timo is one of the two lead developers, probably the lead developer of Aspect and of the underlying libraries. And so um, he's going to basically <laughs> participate as well. And then we have, I believe, four people in the room who are um, what I might call expert user developers, okay? And so they are students at, and postdocs here at CIDR. So I want you to, so, um, so they're going to be part of the team. They don't really know this. <laughs> they're going to be available <laughs> to answer a questions a little bit. Their <laughs> names aren't quite up there. It's not up there yet. So uh, Katrina, could you raise your hand? Okay, there's Katrina and uh, Julianne back there. And Renee, okay, and Ian is around somewhere. There, there's Ian. So, uh, so all of these, uh, all of these scientists have uh, used Aspect and have actually participated in uh, what we call the hackathon, where they went to uh, Texas A&M and spent two intensive weeks developing um, parts of uh, parts of Aspect, this code. And so they, that makes them really experts. And so that means that um, you know there's some distributed expertise around. Um, did you? Have it? You look like you wanted to say something. No. no? Okay. 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 So I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to hand this over to Eric. This will be there'll be an introductory sort of talk about what the code is about, and then uh, we will proceed to run it and do some experiments. Okay. All right. Oh, I got yeah. my own little. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Luis, for introducing me. Um, so yeah, today we'll run through the aspect code a little bit. Uh, first of all, I want to just talk briefly a little about numerical modeling. Um, maybe some of you, you know, haven't done too much with it, so I want to try and build just a little bit of a base to help you understand what we're doing, and then you know, repeat that base, showing you how it applies to aspect. Uh, so also, like she mentioned, um, Timo and Wolfgang did the majority of the work on this code, but I get to do the tutorial, so. Timo and I agreed that anything goes wrong, I get the blame, and anything goes right, he gets the credit. So, yeah. 
Um, and then also, uh, you know, I've, I've done some coding uh, for Aspect, but also Katrina, Julianne, Renee, and Ian have all done a lot of work as well. So they also deserve a lot of the credit. Okay, so first of all, um, I hope everyone has the virtual machine installed and running. All right, we got a thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. At least one person. Yeah, at least one person. <laughs> I think I have it running on my computer, so that's two. Um, okay, so we will be showing the same setup on the, pr on the screen over there, and you know, we'll be typing in the commands slowly so you can follow along. And you know, when, you, when you finish this step, I'll, ask, I'll say, you know, please raise your hand when you're done. I'm not going to like call on you or anything. I just want to make sure everyone has finished before we keep going. OK? Um, OK, yeah. So like I mentioned, um, you'll run everything on the virtual machine. Um, and we distributed the USB stick for it. And basically, the way the virtual machine works is it simulates another computer on your computer. And the benefit of this is you know, everyone might have a little different setup on their computer. Some people don't have compilers. Some people don't have certain software. Some people don't have libraries. And so rather than trying to do everything from scratch and spending hours and hours, oh, you know, this doesn't compile on my computer, you know, we just have everything completely ready to go. And so with any luck, you know, there will be about four or five other tutorials that use the virtual machine. And you'll just be able to get right into them. And we won't have to worry about different platforms or anything like that. Um, and if you want to install Aspect or other codes on your own machine, um, you know, outside of the virtual machine, uh, please talk to the developers or me or Timo, and we can help you with that for your own research. So my view on a tutorial is kind of tell you in the beginning why you're doing it. Um, and so my, my view when I created this tutorial was by the end of the tutorial, you should be able to understand why numerical models are used. I mean, it's not just a way to get papers. There's real reasons for it. Um, you should be able to describe a numerical model and understand some of the basic components of it. And also, more importantly, understand some of the shortcomings. And one thing I found was, you know, with my generation especially, or younger researchers, is kind of the view that if a computer gave you an answer, it must be right. Um, and that's not quite true. So I want to go a little bit into why numerical models might be insufficient in certain times and how you can address that. Uh, and then getting more specifically into aspect, um, understanding how to use aspect, uh, editing the parameters for an aspect simulation, and actually running an aspect simulation, analyzing the results. OK, so to reiterate that a little bit, um, we'll look at why should we use numerical modeling? What is a numerical model? Uh, how do we set up and use the virtual machine? Just a quick tutorial. Um, and how do we do numerical modeling with aspect? And then as kind of a, a final exam, we'll, have the, we'll split up the, the audience into different groups. And you'll model uh, different points, uh, data points, in order to uh, understand the Nusselt-Rayleigh relationship. OK. Well, first of all, are there any questions so far? Awesome. I'm doing perfect. OK. So why use numerical modeling? OK, well, you know, basically, there are many reasons, but generally in this field, uh, the main reasons are that you can't create another Earth, or you can't create another universe yet. Um, you know, there, there are just some things that are experimentally too far off our time scales to be able to recreate from scratch. And you, know, you can get to those things experimentally by isolating a very tiny part of the system. But if you want to look at the system as a whole, numerical modeling is a way to essentially recreate uh, you know, an ideal system mathematically and look how it uh, responds to different parameters or uh, different approximations. So some areas where numerical modeling is used, for example, is protein folding, where you've got things going on on the nanometer scale and the, what is that? If you're lucky, you get tens of microseconds, but the actual folding is happening on, you know, picosecond. The, the, the modeling you need to do is extremely fast. Uh, galactic evolution, you're talking, you know, huge distances and, you know, billions of years. And you're not, we can't yet create another universe. So if we want to study how the universe formed or how it's changing over time, we have to do a numerical model of it. And finally, you know, in our own area, uh, planetary dynamics. So you're talking about thousands of kilometers and billions of years. Okay. Uh, 
So really quickly, I just want to give you a couple examples of numerical models that have been used. Uh, this right here is actually aspect. And let's see, nope, I got to click it to run it. Um, click here, OK. And so this is a simple aspect simulation. Um, and you can see, if you look very closely, you can see some of the adaptive mesh refinement that Luis discussed. And you see the mantle plumes uh, rising and then uh, cooling. Uh, plumes going down and then mixing going on. Um, and so you can see the temperature isosurfaces and uh, the core in the surface, core is heat, uh -huh, heated, uh, surface is cooled. And so this is just a quick example of you know, what aspect can do in terms of numerical modeling. Another example that you'll play with uh, next Thursday, I believe. Wednesday. Wednesday, OK. Uh, is by Hiroki Matsui. Uh, and that's Calypso, which is a uh, core dynamo simulation. And here's a quick example of that, where he looked at the radial magnetic field strength. And so you can see a clear dipole in this, but you can also see that it's a changing over time. So by modeling this, we hope to understand um, how the magnetic field reverses or how you get these fine scale structures in the field. OK. so. I just showed you some pretty pictures, but what I didn't tell you is that each of those simulations, any simulation you run really, involves approximations and trade-offs. Okay, so one thing is, you know, in the real world, or mathematically at least, you have an infinite number of points. And in the real world, you have almost an infinite number of points, you know, every single atom or every single electron or you know, however fine you want to go. And we don't have computers that can handle that much at this time. And so you're making an approximation when you do a numerical model. Um, you know, you're, you're not computing an infinite number of points. You're computing a discrete number of points. And so you're going to lose some accuracy in your solution that way. Uh, you're also generally, in a lot of these simulations, you're not solving these equations exactly. You're making linear approximations to these equations. And so you're going to lose more accuracy that way. Um, and then finally, this can come in uh, to play in some simulations. Computers don't represent numbers with infinite precision. You know, there's a cutoff on how precise they can be. And so over, you know, if you take a number that's not quite right, and then you add it to another number that's not quite right, and you keep doing that a billion times, your final number is going to be possibly a fair bit off. And so each of these can introduce a slight amount of error into your simulation. And if you're not careful, it can render your results invalid. So we need to, we'll look at this a little more later on, but you need to understand when you run a numerical model that you're not necessarily getting a perfectly exact answer. It depends on the problem. It depends on how you're solving it. OK, so now I've sold you on why to use numerical models. Um, let's discuss what on earth they even are. Um, so in the view that we're going to take here, a numerical model consists of about six components. Um, you know, you could argue some of these are redundant, or you know, there are a few more that deserve to be in here. But roughly, you can define a numerical model with these six components. Uh, the first one is the rules of the model, uh, which are generally like the equations that you're going to solve. Uh, the second one is the discretization of the model. So I said you can't do an infinite number of points in your simulation. So how do you break up your simulation into these discrete points that you calculate on? OK, that's the, that's the second part of a numerical model. The third one is the parameters. So you have to say things like, you know, what are the material properties of the Earth? Or what is gravity like? Or um, you know, just different parameters that you need to put into your model in order for it to be physically realistic. OK, and there's the dependent and independent variables. OK, that uh, again feeds into the rules. So there are variables that uh, will change based on where you are in your domain. And there are variables that are independent. So uh, that's another part of the numerical model. Uh, the next one is the initial state of the model. Um, you can't just kind of start off a model from, from just undefined. Because if, you know, when it starts off, it's a, if it's undefined, then you're just going to go off into undefined territory. So you have to define what is the initial state of the model? What is the, the composition initially? What is the temperature like? What is the, um, you know, the material at different points in your model? And then finally, what are the boundary conditions? Um, occasionally in simulations, you can have 
something of an infinite uh, domain. Like if you're doing uh, you know, an n-body simulation and you just kind of ignore everything outside. But in most of the models that we work with, you need to define what happens on the edges, because you can't go out to infinity with the Earth. It, it has to stop at some point. OK, so these are sort of the, the six pieces of a numerical model that we'll work with. OK, so to give you a little more detail, um, there are the rules, OK? And what we will work with uh, in aspect, these are partial differential equations. And I believe um, Michael Manga and uh, who was it? This Alan McNamara um, uh, derived these kinds of equations uh, yesterday and the day before. But basically, it's just any equation that describes how the, the uh, model should move, should change. Um, so here are a few examples. You have like conservation of mass, conservation of momentum. Um, in n-body simulations, you'd have like gravitational attraction between bodies. Um, in newer astrophysical simulations, you might have uh, equations that describe the interaction between uh, dark energy or dark matter, those sorts of things. OK, and then there's the discretization of the model. Um, like I mentioned, you, know, you can't have an infinite number of points, and so you have to divide up the model into a finite number of points that you calculate on. Uh, so on the left here, we have just a simple 16 by 16 cell mesh. And we're going to solve whatever our equations are, whatever our rules are, will be solved on this mesh here. Uh, here's a little more complex example. It's a quarter shell in 3D. And you can see that this is adaptively refined. And so the discretization right here is much more fine because we care about the solution, perhaps, in the core more than we care about up near the surface. OK? So the discretization of the model is the second component of what goes into this. OK, the third is the model parameters. Um, these are generally input by the user. Uh, and they affect the, simu the, the physics of the, the simulation of the numerical modeling, um, but they don't change during the simulation. Okay, and so examples of this might be things like, <laughs> might be things like uh, material properties or the dimensions of the simulation. So uh, you might say, like, I'm, I'm going to work with a one meter by one meter box, and the size of that box doesn't change during the simulation. Or you might say gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared going down, and that just stays constant during the whole simulation. OK, and let's see. So here's an example of a few of these parameters um, as they'll apply to today's example and aspect. Things like viscosity, density, gravity, specific heat capacity, thermal conductivity. Um, I should point out, in today's example, we will treat all these as parameters. Like you just set them once, and they're constant everywhere in the Earth throughout the simulation. And in reality, that's not true. You know, viscosity changes, density changes, and so on. And so um, aspect can handle dynamic uh, values of these. So you can have things like, you know, as you go deeper in the Earth, the density changes, or the density is a function of pressure and temperature and location or, and co uh, material composition and so on. So you, with aspects, you can make these very complicated in order to model what you're looking at. OK, the dependent and independent variables. Um, these will depend on the equations uh, that you're using. Um, the independent variables will generally be related to time and space. So these are things like you know, where in your domain you're looking at with your equations and where in time you're looking at with your equations. Um, the examples of dependent aspect variables uh, would be things like temperature, velocity, pressure, density, viscosity, and so on. And uh, here are a couple examples of them. So we run a simulation over, uh, looks like, 12 billion years here. And uh, the mean volume temperature changes over time. This is a calculated value. And the uh, root mean squared velocity is also changing over time. OK, so those are examples of the dependent variables in aspect. OK, next we have the initial state of the model. Um, and OK, so yeah, this just, in a time-dependent, uh, time-varying uh, simulation, um, you have to define what happens at t equals 0 in order to move on to t equals 1 and so on. And so the tricky thing about this is that if you have a very chaotic system, then your initial state can strongly affect your results. Um, so here's a quick example with aspect. Uh, the initial temperature 
in aspect is defined, oh, where are we? Okay. So the initial temperature in aspect is defined right here. It's basically, it's a function of where in X and Y you are. And it's just, it's a linear temperature profile with a slight perturbation. Okay, um, so here's an example right here on the left. And here's another example right here on the right. And they look nearly identical. But the perturbation is just slightly, you know, tilted in one of them. And so after running the simulation forward for a long time, the dynamics are reversed. Okay, so the thing with the initial conditions is that you need to be a little careful because the initial conditions of your simulation can drastically change your final results. Okay, and finally, the boundary conditions. So the domain is not infinite, at least in what we're going to do today. So we need to define what happens on the boundaries. Um, and this has to be done for all the dependent variables or the problems undefined. So, for example, with aspect, you need to define the boundary temperature and the boundary velocity. Um, and examples of those would be, for temperature, you could say uh, the bottom is heated and the top is cooled. Okay? Or, um, you know, for the mantle, the example would be the interior is heated, the, the exterior is cooled. That's, I know that's not quite right, um, but that's an approximation that we'll use for now. Um, or velocity, another one is, um, you could say material can flow through the boundaries. It can flow through at a certain rate. Or another example, I believe uh, uh, Rene is doing something along these lines of using prescribed velocity on the surface of the Earth. Is that you're using G plates? Okay, yeah. So using prescribed velocity on the surface of the Earth in order to understand how that interacts with the, uh, the mantle movement underneath. Okay, so that's prescribing what velocity happens on the surface of the Earth in order to uh, simulate what happens in the, the inner, in the mantle. Okay, so I, wow, I blasted through that pretty fast. Okay, so now let's go on to using aspect. Um, and so if you want to, you can break open your laptops because we're going to start running things in just a second. Um, aspect is used uh, to a first order through a parameter file. Um, if you really need to, you get down into the code and you add new features. But for what we're going to be doing today, you just, you change a parameter file and the parameter file tells what sort of, it, it basically goes through the uh, six points that I mentioned before. It tells the boundary conditions, it, uh, it tells what variables you're using, it tells the parameters to use like viscosity and um, uh, density and so on. Um, so by the end of this tutorial, we want you to be able to run aspect on the virtual machine, uh, understand the parameter file layout so that you're able to run your own simulations, just you know, play around with it. Um, and you know, we, a lot of times we get just kind of a bunch of numbers that come out of these simulations. So we also want to learn how to visualize these, um, how to load them into ParaView in this case, and how to actually see what's going on. Um, and finally, uh, we're going to try to look a little bit at, you know, when we run these uh, simulations with aspect, uh, what limits are we hitting in terms of accuracy? Okay, so before we actually run the code, are there any questions? Nope? Okay. So uh, let's move over to the, the command console here. So if you can push the Kido button, <laughs> start, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it went onto the other screen, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Eventually, you should get to the point of seeing this desktop right here. So once you are able to see the desktop, please raise your hand. Whoa. Oh, my God. <laughs> we got that far on Monday. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, okay, great. All right, now comes the real test. So is anybody nodding? Yeah, maybe I should say that. Is any, I don't want to, like, you know. Shame. Shame, yeah. Okay. Uh-oh. Okay. 
OK, so to start off with, let's open up the terminal, which is this black icon here. Just click on it once. All right, and that will open up this terminal window here. And then type in cd space. Oh, yeah, it's up here on the screen as well, yeah. Tilde slash tutorial slash aspect. OK, can you the return? OK, and then just to make sure you're in the right place, uh, you can type ls, which lists the contents of this directory. And there should be three files. There's the aspect code on the left. There's a directory that will store the output. And then there's the tutorial.prm file. OK, so is everyone at this point? I don't, well, we lost one. <laughs> Are we, oh, you're on? Okay. Okay, good. Everything's good here? Okay. <laughs> Great. It's so fast. Well, now it is. Yeah. Now it is, yeah. <laughs> OK, so can you go ahead and run Aspect? So now, yeah, the reason I wanted to make sure everyone got to that point is because when you actually run Aspect, it's going to just throw output at you. So Hero, could you? Yes. Dot slash aspect tutorial.prm. OK, and now. Yeah, now it's now it's just flying through. We're going through billions of years in just seconds. All right, I think it. Yeah. Okay. Good. It ends. So that's uh, 232 <coughs> steps, I believe. Yes. I'm sorry. Is it? This like an 80s vintage simulation. You'll see in a minute. We're going to visualize it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's like the world's Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think Luis might have mentioned, you know, every one of your laptops right now is basically equivalent to the fastest machine on Earth about 20, 22 years ago. And so that's, that's one of the fun things, you know. You're, what you're able to do now, you basically wouldn't have been able to do 20 years ago just because lack of computer power. OK, so has everyone? run the simulation and um, seeing this final clock measurement, wall time measurement. Show of hands. All right. Yes, if you have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess. I don't want to like shame people, but OK. I guess who, who has not? Who has not gotten that? So we can. Oh, maybe? He has an awesome computer. It has the 12 seconds. Mine took 22 seconds. Oh, well, yeah, it just it depends. Also, it, it, it might depend if you're plugged in. I think, like, if you're plugged in, you might be able to run a little faster. It might, if you're, if you're on battery, it might slow you down. Yeah. So actually, that's, that's one more thing. You know, a lot of these... A lot of these tutorials, they use a lot of battery power. So if your laptop is like nearing the end, I think we tried to put power strips around. I don't know if they're if they made it, but yeah, if, if your laptop's like under 25% battery, you might want to plug in because you might, you know, drop out in the middle of the t tutorial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so it just what you just saw was this huge output you know, showing everything that happened during the simulation. Um, and rather than trying to scroll back up through that, uh, it also outputs it in the, uh, the output directory. So if you can open that up, just type gedit. Well, ah, no, OK. <laughs> so that's all the stuff in the output directory. But if, so step three here, if you open the log, just gedit output 
slash log dot txt. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So but it's easier just to do it on the the command line, I think. Okay. So. Okay. So in the very beginning of the simulation, it tells you some of the parameters that it's using. Okay. So, for example, the, the domain depth of the model, from the top of the model to the bottom of the model, is 3 million meters, uh, so 3,000 kilometers. So we're, gonna, we're using a model here that's it's actually square, but it's kind of on the order of the size of the Earth, so that we can use other parameters that you know, you're, you're accustomed to. Um, there are things like the, uh, the reference viscosity in Pascal's is you know, 5 times 10 to the 24th. Um, Reference uh, specific heat capacity is 1,250 and so on. Okay, so the thing that we want to look at though is uh, the Rayleigh number, the equivalent Rayleigh number for this simulation. And in this case, it was 10,000. Okay, so it's it's not that high, but it's a start. Okay, so the main reason that I wanted to show you that is because later on you'll be ne you'll need to change some of these parameters in order to change the Rayleigh number, and so you can look in this log to see what the Rayleigh number is that you're using. Okay, and if you, sorry, Hero, could you scroll down a little bit more? And then, and now that's fine, yeah, that's fine. And then if you just look, you know, it just tells you every single time step what it's doing. So, you know, time step seven, we're at uh, seven billion years in the simulation, and, you know, we solved the temperature system, we solved the Stokes system. Here are some statistics about the whole system. You know, this is the, the mean and max velocity. Um, these are the heat fluxes. Uh, you know, we're writing out uh, output, the, the state of the system into this file and so on. So this is just how you can see what the simulation is doing. Okay, so now that we did all that, it's time for me to talk again. Um, so like I mentioned before, you know, what, what's a numerical model? Well, it consists of roughly these, these six components. So let's go through the parameter file that we just ran and understand what each of these components are in aspect. Okay, so if you can close that and then type gedit tutorial.prm. Okay, so yeah, just this command right here, gedit tutorial.prm. And Hero's doing it a different way, I guess. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, so this PRM file, parameter file, explains what the simulation is doing. Okay? Yeah, okay. Does any does anybody not see the parameter file? Yes. Oh, G edit, it's right here. G edit tutorial dot PRM. Yeah. I'm sorry? <laughs> How much hotter? Really? Oh, it's like, okay, 23 seconds. Yeah, okay. Oh, you're already way ahead of us. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, no, we'll get to that. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay, so I believe everyone is good to go. So let's go through the different components. Um, first of all are the rules, and you don't change these. Um, in the, uh, in the parameter file. These are essentially hard-coded into aspect. Um, and you've seen most of these before. There's like mass conservation, momentum conservation, uh, heat production, friction heating, uh, material compression, and so on. And these, um, you know, not, not necessarily, like you don't necessarily have to have internal heat production on. You can always set that to zero, for example, which we do uh, in this model. Um, but these just give you an idea of the equations that we're working with. And then just because every, every field uses different notation, um, I just include a description of what each of the, the symbols mean. So velocity is represented with U, pressure with a lowercase p, temperature, strain rate, viscosity with eta, uh, density, gravity, and so on. 
Okay, so this is part one. These are the rules that we're running with. Okay, so if we look in the parameter file, um, there are a few, uh, few parameters that we, we start off with. And just so you know, uh, at the bottom of each of these slides, I'm going to show like a box like this with the parameters. And then the number here is the line that that parameter is on. So uh, here, if you can just click on yeah, the dimension. Okay, so now if you see in the lower right corner here, it says line three. Okay, so that will let you know what line you're on, and then you can see what that corresponds to. But we're going to go in order anyway, so hopefully you won't get lost. Okay, so the first thing is, uh, what dimension are we running in? Um, one of the clever things about Aspect, the way it was written, is that you can change from two dimensions to three dimensions just by changing that number right there. And it will automatically reconfigure all the equations to be three-dimensional. You need to, you know, possibly you need to change a few other things, like if you have a box, for example, in two dimensions there are just four boundaries, in three dimensions you now have six boundaries. So you now need to say what happens on those two new boundaries. But, yep? Can we go to Viagra? For it? Uh, I don't think so, no. And I don't think you can go to one dimension either. I don't think that was ever implemented. Yeah. <laughs> two or three. But, you know, that's, you know, mo most of the, the codes that have uh, been developed up to this point are either only two dimension or only three dimension. And so the advantage of doing it this way is that, like you just saw, two dimensional simulations are incredibly fast. You know, you can just run through it, and you can you can basically play with the simulation in almost real time, and figure out what works. You know, how do you set up your uh, boundary conditions? How you put in a subducting slab, and so on. And then you change to three dimensions, and all of your work will be, hopefully, you know, converted over into the third dimension for your real simulations. Okay. Um, all right. The next thing is uh, use years in output instead of seconds. Okay, uh, and this is important because um, a lot of you know what we deal with uh, is on the order of thousands or millions or billions of years, and trying to understand you know like how many seconds are in 200 million years, you know just off the top of your head, it's it's a little difficult to understand, and so internally Aspect will use seconds for all its calculation. It's using SI units for all its calculations, but in the output, to make things a little easier to understand, you can tell it to output in years. And then that way, you know, when you're working with an Earth-sized model on those time scales, it's much easier to understand. OK, the next one, um, obviously, we can't run the simulation forever. And so we specify an end time. Um, and in this case, it's 50 billion years. OK? Uh, and like you probably saw in the simulation, it ended at 5e10 e, years. And then, of course, you, oh, yeah, one thing I should mention, um, uh, I'm, I, my background's computer science, so I don't even think about this, but uh, a lot of people aren't used to saying 5e10 or like 2e minus 3 or something like that. Um, in uh, programming, a lot of times, rather than write something times 10 to the something power, we say number e number. So this is 5 times 10 to the 10th. Okay, if you wanted to write 2 times 10 to the 4th, you'd write 2e4. Okay, so this is just a shorthand convenient notation for writing those scientific notation numbers. Eric? Yes? Does D accept on a instead of 5e10? D? 5d10. Not that I'm aware of. Has, have you ever seen that? No. Uh, in for example, sometimes. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, and then... So if, if you're using the years in output, then this is years. If you're using seconds in your output, that's seconds. Yeah, it's years or seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then finally, there's the where are you going to put the output? Um, you just have to tell it a directory and make sure the directory exists. Okay. Uh, next, the the second item on the list is the discretization. Okay. So Aspect has many different kinds of uh, 
uh, models, uh, discretizations that you can use. Um, things like, you know, a box or a shell or uh, there are probably other ones. Uh, what are, can you tell me any other? Sphere. Sphere, yeah. Shell, shell. Right, yeah. So that's another, another advantage of Aspect is that it's not constrained to a particular geometry. Many codes, you know, you have to use a 2D, a box geometry or, you know, a shell geometry. Aspect, you can effectively write your own. Um, I even did a strange simulation where it was a box earth with a circular core. Um, so you can change the geometry however you like. Uh, and in our simulation, we're using a 4,200 kilometer by 3,000 kilometer deep box. Okay, so that's what we're defining right here. We're saying, first of all, we're defining the geometry model. Okay, and that model is going to be a box. And we could change this to shell or sphere or whatever we want. Okay, and then we say, okay, defining that box, the x extent is 4.2 times 10 to the 6 meters or 4,200 or 4, uh, uh, kilometers and 3,000 kilometers in Y. Um, and if we were using a three-dimensional model, we'd also have to declare what the Z dimension extent is. Um, okay, and then one thing to note, you know, the, the input, the parameter right here is using uh, meters. Um, and so you have to ensure that you're consistent in your choice of um, uh, input uh, uh, definitions. So if you use meters here and you use feet in another part of the uh, parameter file, you're going to get incorrect results. Okay? Yep. I don't know whether yeah. you want to say this, but the possible values and the possible parameters you can define there are listed in the values. So oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. So included on the USB stick that you were distributed is an entire manual for aspect. It's probably 150 pages, and it describes every parameter that you can use, what the default values are. So many of the parameters, um, if you don't define them, then they're set to a default value. And I'll, I'll go over an example of that later uh, with regards to the uh, material pro properties. Um, but yes, every, every parameter uh, is defined in detail, like the acceptable values for it, uh, the, the units, um, uh, what the default values are, that's all defined in the manual. So if you have any questions in regards to that, feel free to ask me or feel free to check the manual. Okay, so the second part of the discretization is the refinement. And like I mentioned, you know, we can't have an infinite number of points, and so we have to choose, you know, a certain, a certain breakup of our domain. And since we're just using a box, the question is just how do we divide the box up into cells, okay? Um, and in Aspect, uh, there's just by default, there's a pretty simple way of doing this. Um, you just say how many times do you want to refine down? Okay, so you start off with a two by two box. That's refinement level one. And then if you go to refinement level two, it breaks each of those cells into two by two boxes. Okay, it, sorry, two by two cells. And then if you go to refinement level three, it breaks each of them into a two by two cell. And then refinement level four breaks each of those into two by two cells and so on. And so this way you can just get uh, double the number of cells in each dimension by increasing the refinement level. Let's see. Harry? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was added recently, I believe, yeah. Yes? Multi-grid or adaptive mesh refinement? Oh, okay, okay. So, no, this, I, you probably mean adaptive mesh refinement. Um, this right now is not doing adaptive mesh refinement. Um, the way that we would do adaptive mesh refinement is we would change this to some value like one or two. And then what it would do, it gets a little complex, but it determines based on whatever criteria you say, maybe like refine where there's a sharp temperature gradient. Okay, so wherever there's a sharp temperature gradient, it will increase the number of cells right around there. Right, but then the trick is, what you do then is you say time steps between rest refinement. Let's say set that to 10. 
Okay, so it'll start off with a mesh, you know, with whatever, uh, you know, refinement near the temperature, and then the temperature will change over 10 time steps. You know, it'll, the gradient will move upwards. Okay, then what it'll do is it will say, okay, now what's the best mesh for this new temperature configuration? And it will re-refine the mesh and move it, you know, up a little bit. And then, you know, 10 time steps later, it will re-refine again and so on. Yes? So if you put initial adaptive refinement of two, mm -hmm. it would go like up to two finer. So it would be exactly. like seven in places, but five in other places? Correct. Or would it degrade the five to a four or something? Um... <laughs> yes, so, uh, it, there, there are other parameters I'm not showing here that kind of relate to your question. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. I think it's Yeah, on. maybe I should uh, expand on that a little bit. So what you see here is uh, what Eric explained is you actually start by a one-by-one one box, and you create like a hierarchy, right? You take your first cell, the one box, and you refine it into four smaller ones, and then so on, and so on, and so on. Mm -hmm. And you can not only do this globally, as it's shown here, but adaptively. But you have this hierarchy of cells. In some places, they are smaller. In some places, they are bigger. But that has nothing to do with multigrid. Multigrid is something else. Yeah. But it's, it's a hierarchy of cells, right? And um, this is used for adaptive refinement, because you can look at a certain cell and decide, oh, I need to refine this. Or you can look at four cells somewhere and say, oh, my solution is smooth. I can coarsen in this area. So when you turn on adaptive mesh refinement, what will happen is some places will be coarsened. So you can actually get coarser than this 8x8. Eight eight, and some areas are refined. And, what, and it, it turns out here, the sum of this and this gives you the finest level that you, that you, that you will reach. Right? What's the coarsest level? In, in this case, the coarsest level is not restricted. So it could go all the way to just one cell if it right. wanted and to. And also, when you refine, when you turn on adaptive mesh refinement, you can say, like, at most, coarsen 10% of cells, and at most, refine 50% of cells. And so that way you can control, like, the balance between how much are refined or um, coarsened. Yeah. So when you refine down, oh, how do you get the value at that smaller cell? Right. Well, you, in, you interpolate it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you interpolate it, but at least, I mean, you're doing no worse than you were already doing because you're already interpolating between them. Yeah. Yeah. And then hopefully with that a higher level of accuracy, you're resolving the equations better right there. And so that interpolation will um, not affect you in the long run. Are you uh, It depends on the element type, I believe. Is well, uh, the standard finite elements are piecewise polynomials on each cell, and so you do polynomial interpolation. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. yeah. When you're refining, are you keeping the number of degrees of freedom about the same, or is that you're changing the number of degrees? They are changing. You're changing it, yeah. But it's not as much, like if you, if you do refine 5 and adaptive refinement 5, you're using, well, unless you set like refine every single cell, you're using less total degrees of freedom than if you do refine 10 in the beginning. And that's, that's kind of the goal of adaptive mesh refinement. Only you know, go into detail where you actually need it. And it's, I believe it's roughly a n log n kind of growth. Yes? OK, so, so in this case where we don't have adaptive refinement, mm -hmm. you gave us the number 3. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't understand how a for such a big box divided into Yes. <laughs> well, no, that's in, that's intentional. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't work that well. Okay. <laughs> it runs, yeah, runs exactly. That's why I chose it. That is exactly why I chose it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you can hang out up here if you want. Thanks. Yeah. Defend me. Yeah. It's still zero zero. Okay. So yeah, I mean, you know, later on you can change any of these parameters that you want. You can see what happens if you make the domain, you know, a million miles wide. Or uh, what happens if you change? Uh, what happens if you turn on adaptive refinement? You know, once we go into the visualization, you'll be able to see a little better how the mesh changes through time. Okay, so I'll continue on. Oh, let's see. Yeah, I go until 3:30. Okay, so I'm going to have to speed forward a little bit. Um, okay, so the model parameters. Um, another another parameter that you set is the gravity and the material model. Uh, the gravity is pretty straightforward. We're just doing, you know, vertical, uh, straight down gravitational acceleration at 9.8 meters per second squared, and uh, we have a material model, 
And by default, uh, we're using all these values. So I'm not actually defining any of these in the parameter file. These are just the default values that you use. So something like specific heat capacity is 1,250. Or uh, let's see here. Uh, kappa, for example, is uh, 1 times 10 to the negative 6, and so on. So these are just the default values that we're using. And the only thing that you need to change is the viscosity. So we're going to take this box that has roughly you know, whatever viscosity we need in order to get a Rayleigh number of 10,000. And you're going to change the viscosity of that material in order to get different behavior during the simulation. OK, uh, going forward a little bit more. I mentioned that we have to define the initial temperature field. So this is the definition right here. Um, we're able to do a functional expression to represent the initial temperature field. And basically, this is just what I showed you a little while ago. It's a linear temperature profile, uh, cooled on the top, hot on the bottom, with a slight perturbation. And I made the perturbation very obvious right here. Uh, so in this case, it's just uh, you know, slightly, slightly heated on the left, slightly cooled on the right. And so just based on what you know about uh, convection, you would expect uh, the, the, the convection pattern to start moving in a clockwise direction, because the hot material on the left will start going up, the cooler material on the right will go down, and it'll create sort of a clockwise convection pattern. OK, and then the boundary conditions. Um, so I mentioned you have to define the, uh, the temperature and the velocity boundary conditions. Um, in this case, we are saying that uh, the top and bottom have these specified temperatures, 273 degrees uh, Kelvin on the top and 3,600 on the bottom. Um, VED already changed those around just for fun. Um, and uh, it's also uh, free slip boundary conditions. So basically, it's just an, an isolated box. Uh, the sides are insulated, and the top and bottom are cooled and heated. OK? And finally, uh, one more bit. Uh, Aspect also has some post-processing capabilities. So we're just telling it to print out statistics about what's the, uh, the velocity of the system, what's the total temperature of the system, um, we're also having it output uh, some visualization data that we're going to look at in just a second, and also use particle tracers in order to see how the flow looks. OK, so uh, like Renee mentioned, you, know, you can find more details about all these parameters in the manual. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to ask me or Timo or any of the half dozen people in here who use Aspect for their own research. OK, so now we'll get to sort of the fun part, um, visualizing results with Paraview. OK, so we'll use Paraview. Um, if you don't know, Paraview is basically just a program uh, that is designed for visualization of large data sets. It's already on the virtual machine. So let's open it up by clicking the red, green, and blue icon on the left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so I'll wait a few seconds for that to, to load up. OK, anybody not have that up and running? Yeah, oh, just still waiting? OK, OK. <laughs> All right, I'll go ahead if that's OK. So a quick explanation. Um, on the very top, you have the toolbars. Uh, that describes how you can manipulate the data or select what part of the data to look at. Uh, right below that, you have the pipeline browser, which shows you what data you're looking at and how you're manipulating it. So you're maybe slicing it or taking an ISO surface or um, you know, calculating some subset of the data. Uh, the object inspector lets you change certain properties of the data, so how you want it to be colored, uh, what range of data you want to look at, um, any kind of manipulations of uh, describing how you want to see the data. And then finally, this big gray area here shows you the, uh, the view. And so yeah, you can see Hero kind of spinning it around. Um, so right now, this is a 3D uh, view. But our data is 2D, so you're not going to be able to do that much longer. OK, so let's start off by opening the solution.xdmf file. 
Okay, and so you do this by choosing open from the file menu or the open icon in the very upper left. Okay, and then open up tutorial, not aspect, tutorial and then aspect and output. And now you see these three files, uh, solution.xdmf. Okay. Okay, so now still we don't get to see anything. Hold on. <laughs> so now you have the file, yeah, in your pipeline browser. Yes. Okay, so but before we click that, um, so right down here we can see these are the, va the values that we have stored in this file. So we have the temperature, the pressure, and the velocity. Okay, so that's just what we output from our simulation. Okay, so now... Uh, let's go ahead and click apply. Does it automatically change the two-dimensional? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if you s click apply, now you can see what it looked like at time step zero. Okay, and you can also see the time up here as well, so time zero. And by default, it shows the temperature field. And so this is our initial temperature field, just linear, hot to cold, and there is, take my word for it, a very slight perturbation in there. Okay, and that's going to get things started. Okay, so now we can look at what happens over time. So go ahead and click the play button, which is right here, the little triangle, and watch what happens over time. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Raise, please raise your hand if you are not, if you can't play yet. No? It is? Okay. No, it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can see them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, so you yeah, you got to the end. And so, sorry, here, can you click play one more time? So, oh, you are, yeah. So it just, you can click play as many times as you want, and it'll keep looping on through. Um, is that a question, or you need help? Paraview is interpolating the output, yeah. <laughs> no. Maybe. Well, if it's linear elements, maybe, but yeah. But it's not linear elements. Okay, yeah. Uh, you, can, <laughs> you can change the, uh, um, there to surface with edges. Can you click on surface with edges? Yeah, so this... Then you see the 8x8 eight eight mesh. Ved. That's, that's how you can see the mesh. So, Hiro, could you show one more time? If you choose... Yeah, that's that's how it's it's linear in this, not in the simulation. Uh, so in the simulation, like degree polynomial. Well, it depends on the variable. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> depends on the setup, but um, yeah, in you in aspect as per default in each cell, you would have quadratic polynomials to represent the temperature in each cell. So quadratic in x and quadratic in y, and what is output here is actually only linear a linear version of that. Because most output formats don't support outputting quadratic things. Okay, so hopefully everyone has been able to see the neat little animation here. Um, okay, so sorry. One question is, um, sorry, can you turn off looping, Hero? Okay, so we let this run to the end, and to step 231. So the question is. At this time step, it doesn't look like anything's happening. You know, the, the temperature field is static. So is this actually a static field? And does anybody want to, to guess? Like, is this, like, if we actually set this up in real life and we saw, you know, material in here, does this right here, the temperature field's not changing at all. Does that mean that it's actually, nothing's happening in there? It's just not moving? No. Thank you, yes. Um, <laughs> Correct, yes, there is material moving. The temperature is staying the same, but the material is actually moving. And so now we'll load in some particles that were generated by the simulation to help visualize that. Okay, so go ahead and open again. Uh, let's see, Hero, can you? So go ahead and open again and open up particle.xdmf. Okay, and so, yeah, just a second. Um, sorry. 
Okay, so then, yeah, click apply. But the trick is that these particles, by default, are colored by just a random number, essentially. And so if you go to the this menu right here, that shows you what to display. Change it to solid color. So change ID up here to solid color. Okay, and that'll just turn all the particles white, so they're a little easier to see. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, in the visualization, it's controlled by pair view, but in the actual simulation calculation, it's controlled by aspect. Yeah. In pair view, it's a linear interpolation. Right. Right. The particle positions are also calculated by aspect using whatever you know second uh, uh, polynomial uh, interpolation aspect is using. Okay. So now, if we click play one more time for this. Now you can see what's actually happening. So even though the velocity field, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the temperature field is static now, you can still see materials moving. And like I predicted before, it's moving in a clockwise fashion because we had a slightly hotter left-hand side, slightly cooler right-hand side. OK. And so you know, very, it, it's pretty obvious. Where's the upwelling material? It's on the left. Where's the downwelling? It's on the right. OK. Um, and then the material in the center is staying in roughly the same position. OK, so particles are just a way to help you visualize the flow patterns uh, in aspect. OK, so I think we're mostly OK with time. So now we will use aspect to study the relationship between the Rayleigh number and the surface heat flux, or well, the, the Nusselt number actually, to be, I should probably change that. Um, so in geodynamics, the Rayleigh number indicates the presence and strength of convection in the mantle. And the Nusselt number is the ratio of convective to conductive heat transfer through, in this case, we're going to look at through the top surface. So the question is, and I'm sure a lot of you already know the answer, um, if the Rayleigh number goes up, how does the Nusselt number change? OK, and so we can do that. We can go you know, set up an experimental apparatus and figure out what happens as you know, we, we change the Rayleigh number like by heating up the, the material more um, and then calculate the Nusselt number at the top. Um, or we can just do it numerically right now. Uh, so we're going to look at how does the Nusselt number change when we increase the Rayleigh number? And how does the mesh resolution affect these results? So, uh, Ved mentioned before that uh, 8 by 8 doesn't seem like enough, okay? And sometimes it's enough, sometimes it isn't, okay? So we're going to look at when is it enough, when is it not? Okay, so one thing that I didn't mention before, uh, we have other output uh, stored from the aspect simulation that you just ran, um, and that's in what's called the statistics file. So if you can g-edit, open up the output slash statistics. So here I was typing it over there, g-edit, output slash statistics. <clears throat> OK, and this has 21 different uh, post-processed calculated uh, values from aspect. So things like you know, which time step number we're on, um, how many cells there are, how many degrees of freedom in both temperature and velocity, uh, what the time step size is, average temperature, minimum temperature, heat flux, and so on. And so we want to look at the heat flux through... So uh, yeah. this is a table with one row per time step yes. and different values in each column. It's just that the lines are wrapped uh, to fit on the screen here. Right. So each... Yeah. Oh, so each, those are each of the boundaries. So let's see if I go way, way back. Oh, there we go. One more. There we go. So yeah, 0, 1, 2, 3. Yeah. Uh, where are we? Oh, OK. OK, so instead of trying to decipher that you know, just by looking at this text file, let's go ahead and plot it. Okay. 
So you might not have used newplot before, but we'll just quickly show you how to use it. Um, so if you can close the statistics file. OK, and then go ahead and type GNUPLOT. Oh, yeah, 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 right here, yeah, sure. OK, so has that, please raise your hand if you have not opened up GNU plot. If you, you, yeah, it'll say GNU plot version 4.6 and so on. All right, are we good? OK. And then, so we're going to plot the appropriate heat flux. Whoop, there we go. <laughs> OK, so go ahead and type this plot, quote, output slash statistics, quote, using 2 colon 20. And that's just 2 is the time. So the x axis will be time. 20 is the heat flux. So the y axis will be the heat flux with lines. And so it'll just connect each point with lines. Yes, semicolon at the end. But you don't need to. Oh, you don't? Oh, OK. <laughs> it's the heat flux at the surface. In what unit? Watts. Watts. Yes. What, is, what are you getting? What? It's what, about 100,000, I think? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's really, yeah, it's, it's you know, what really. Maybe the Rayleigh number is not realistic. Yeah, it's only 10,000 Rayleigh number, so. <laughs> no, 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 it's just such a small heat flux. It is. Well, here's the Okay, so we can tell roughly. And you can use, sorry, Hero, can you move the, the mouse, like right here? So if you move the mouse over this line, you can see roughly the heat flux is about 95,833. 95,000, let's say. So 95,000 watts over the entire surface. OK? Um, and so, oop. yeah. Integration, yeah. Yes. Um, OK, so and we can see that that has ended up in steady state, OK? It's, it's not bouncing around anymore. OK, so what we want to do now is calculate the Nusselt number. And you're just going to have to take my word for it that the Nusselt number is this. So Q is the heat flux that we just got, OK? Uh, so in that case, 95,000. About, yeah, 95,000, I think, divided by 21,892. So that's a Nusselt number of about, what, four, four, four and a half? So yeah. The Nusselt number is defined as the heat flow um, as a, compared to conductive heat flow. Correct, yeah. And so that's, that's, what this, that's what this equation is about right here, exactly, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just I'll skip over that, but this this is the equation to convert the heat flux that you get to the Nusselt number. Can we also assume that all heat flux is a conductive and a soft flux or both of them? Right. Yes. Okay. Well. Okay. We'll well we'll we'll skip that. Okay. So now now comes the homework assignment. OK, so every one of you now has seen the parameter file. You know how to run aspect. You know how to plot the results. And so we want to look at the relationship between the Rayleigh number and the Nusselt number. And up here, we've got uh, four different Rayleigh numbers, 4,000, 20,000, 100,000, 500,000. And we've got these four refinement levels. OK, so there was the question is of, you know, do we actually have enough refinement? Um, to resolve this? And my answer was, it depends on the problem. OK? So we will divide up the group uh, into different combinations of Rayleigh number and refinement. And basically, all you need to do 
you need to change three parts in the parameter file. First part, you need to change the end time. Oh, yeah, thank you, yeah. OK, so if you aspect tutorial. OK, so the first, first one is the end time. OK, so Hero, Hero will give the example of, um, can you go to the top? It's at the top. Well, eight, eight, I think. Right, but we'll do refinement three and four. Oh, oh no, okay, no, I see what you mean. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Sure, sure, yeah, okay, okay, we'll do that. Um, okay, so the first one is the end time. So lower Rayleigh numbers will take a longer time to get into steady state, and so we need to run them for uh, longer, uh, longer simulated times. And higher Rayleigh numbers will, they're much more vigorous and then they settle down quicker so they can run them for a shorter simulated time. But that doesn't necessarily mean, uh, this, you know, it, that doesn't scale necessarily with the number of time steps. So Rayleigh 4000 is not 20 times more time steps than Rayleigh 500,000. Very likely it's, it's less time steps actually. Okay, so Hero, can you change the end time there to uh, Rayleigh 4000? Should we speed yep. up the groups to get them started? Yeah, well, oh, sorry, yeah? Does it matter if you have a capital or a location? No, either one's fine. Good question. Right, capital or lowercase e is, either one is fine. Okay, and then we need to set the viscosity. So in this case, uh, yeah, so the old viscosity was 5 times 10 to the 24th, and so we're making it into 1.2 times 10 to the 25th. Okay, and so we're increasing the viscosity so we get less vigorous convection, so lower Rayleigh number. And then finally, we change the refinement. If you scroll down a little more, uh, keep think, keep going. No, back up, I guess. Uh, no, keep yeah, keep going up. I guess it's above. Yeah, okay, there we go. Okay. So what did you do? <laughs> All right, so yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so then if you can, Hero, can you save that quickly? Okay, and then close it and, oh yeah, quit, quit GNU plot. And then just as before, dot slash aspect tutorial dot PRM. So what you can do here is also uh, pick a different output directory. Then you have the different outputs of your different runs, and you can look at the different statistic files or even plot them into the same right. plot if you want to. Yeah, if you know how to make new directories, yeah. Aspect creates the directories automatically. Oh, it does? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Even 1.1? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Oh, that's one of the good idea. Yeah, no, that's a good idea, yeah. Okay, so, so let's, let's start dividing this up. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. So, so let, me, let me explain one more thing here. One more thing. So I need you to give me the heat flux, okay? So all those question marks, uh, that's what I need from you, okay? So really quick, let me just divide things up, okay? This group right here is Rayleigh 4,000. These guys here are 20,000. And over here is 100,000. And fi yeah, a million if you want. Yeah, 500,000, let's say. OK? Yes? Yeah, but it's OK. And so each of you run the simulation with refinement 3, refinement 4, refinement 5. And then when you have one of these values, just come up and tell me, and we'll start filling in the chart. Yeah. If you want, yeah. Just probably not, but I have all the values already up there, so don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think Timo, can we have the? 
if I may suggest something, if you have a particularly fast modern new computer, I would suggest that you run the Refinement 5. If you have a slow, sluggish computer that's a couple years old, start with 3 and then move forward. And you should always run that GNU plot plot to make sure your run has, run has reached steady state before providing the nestled number. Yes. Right? Well, three no. or four or five. No, you're only doing global refinement well, for this. That's fine. Okay. Uh, if you want, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if you have any questions, yeah, just raise your hand and Timo or so me or Ian will help you. When you have an answer, you need to come up and give the answer so we can put it into this plot and see what happens. Yes. Let me go ahead and... No, I'll go ahead and just set that. Edit data. Space. The name, the name is fixed. You have to have the right spelling and the right number of spaces. But before and after, you can have the same spaces. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What did you get? Nine point nine times ten to the nine. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Oh. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so we have nine point nine times ten to the nine. Oh, three twenty eight, okay. Okay, 328,000 divided by, let's see, what was it? Uh, 21,892. 21,892. Okay, so 14.98. It was this one, right? Yeah. 14.98. Are you running one here? Uh, you find five. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, no, it should be fine. Yeah. Okay, do we have any other values anybody wants to report? Yeah. Oh, soon. Oh, okay. Yeah.
Right. So you actually you don't directly change, change the, the visc number. you don't yeah you don't change the Rayleigh number. You change the components of the Rayleigh number. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's see. If you open up the GNU plot again. Uh, G N U P L O T. Okay, and then try just typing the up arrow, up arrow, yeah, yeah, and then one more time, yeah, and that one should give you, so yep, yeah. so that's the heat flux, and so it ends at about, see if you move your mouse over there, you can, it'll tell you 104,000, yeah. Oh, sorry, just a second. Let me. Okay, refine for what was it? This. <laughs> Seventy-five thousand. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. Seventy-five one thousand. Twenty-one eight eighty-two. Three point. Point four. Three, let's say. Okay. Yeah. Now the number is only calculated from the heat flux, right? Yeah. Yeah. Refine three. Okay. This one. Three point two six nine. Okay. Three point two six nine. And Okay. Any? Either one, yeah. Heat flow. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is this is for refined three. Refined three. Number twenty thousand. Okay. And it's uh, one point four six nine. Okay. Three point two six nine. Sorry, just a second. One point one nine. Yeah. E. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. This is for time. So yeah. Point one ninety five, I think. Yeah. Okay, divided by twenty one eight ninety two, five point four three. Uh, let's see where are we? Five point four three six, let's say. Three six. Great. Okay, and that was refinement three, right? That was for yeah. refinement three. For five point four three six. Yeah. All right. Oh, which one? Which refinement one? Refinement three. Five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand. Excellent. Okay, and we get. Uh, you should be running at 450. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm saying it's only at. Yeah, yeah, 160. Okay. It's a. So, let's see. Um, where did my calculator. Yeah. 160,000 divided by 21892, 7.3. 7.308. Oops. Okay, and then. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. 7.38. You're good. Um, <laughs> I have okay. 20,000 refined four. 20,000 refined four, excellent. Yep. Um, so I'm at like 122,000. 122, 434 roughly, 21, 92, 5.59, 5.59, and then put in, uh, let's see, that was this guy, 5.59. Okay. So I guess uh, I'm getting 4.7. Sorry, what what uh, refinement and Rayleigh number? Uh, uh, refinement five. Okay. Oh wow. Rayleigh number 100,000. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And sorry, what did you get? Four. That's, yeah, 4.7. 4.7. Yeah. Sorry, just what uh, what was the? Oh, this number. Is? Yeah, roughly, just to double check. 103. Yeah, 103.8. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Where's my calculator? There it is. 103,000 divided by 21,892. 4.7, yeah, exactly. Okay, great, thank you. Six times, six times now from the five to the three. What am I doing here? I've got uh, 20,000 refined by. Yeah, um, I got these wrong somehow. 3.27. 5.4, 5.59, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 5.4, 
That doesn't seem right. What did I? Oh, whoops. That should be down. Okay, let's see. One point. There we go. Okay. He's looking right here. I think that's good, yeah. Um, so, do you have one to report? I got the 100,000 really number. Okay. And my. What refinement? Oh, refinement four. Four? Okay. Yeah. And it looks like it's going to steady state around 100,000. Okay, so we'll say 100,000 divided by 21,892. 4.567. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 4.567. Uh, 20,000 refined 5. 20,000 refined, excellent. As 128361. And what do I divide that by? Let's see, 128, sorry? 361. 361, 21,892. So that's 5.86. Yep. Uh, yep. All right. So uh, five point eight six. Yeah. And let's see. Yeah. Five point eight six. Did he get? Yeah, they got that one. Okay. Twenty thousand. Yeah. Slow. I mean, yeah. mine's still going. It's less than ten billion. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat and fill in the rest quickly. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the five the, the five grids are. Um, I mean, the, the really small grids take a really long time. Oh yeah, yeah. Even on really fast computers. Yeah. Let's see. You use all completely same color as me. You use completely same color. It's nice, isn't it? I like it. Yeah, me too. But I'm the <laughs> No, did you finish it? Yeah. Awesome. Well, you won't be able to log on to what is it? Yeah. Like 307,000. Yeah, 307,000, okay. Uh, I think we're ready. So, I think so? 14.02, yeah. We can fill it in. I filled oh, in a few. 14.02, I said, yeah. I do a lot of. Okay, so. I'm just gonna. They're extremely close to what I got before. I'll just, uh, well, I'll just go ahead and. How do I, how do I do the, um, the output again? The new the oh, there's an plot and and plot and run cheating. And you can check the previous command. <laughs> Uh, okay, so. <laughs> so let's let's go ahead and finish this up since we're basically out of time here. So, oh. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Okay. I can understand that you're all excited. It is pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Did Netherlands just lose? All right. So I'll just I'll make my final point, and then we can get to the World Cup. Um, so yeah, these are these are the the results. Um, I added in a few, uh, you know, for my own runs. Um, but basically, this this kind of addresses one of the questions we had before of is this enough resolution? So we had an 8 by 8 grid, and a few people were saying, you know, is that really enough? And the answer was, it depends on the problem. Okay, so you can see the blue line here is the lowest, like the, the most coarse refinement. It's the 8 by 8 grid. And for problems, you know, with a very low Rayleigh number, 4,000, it, it gets almost exactly the same solution as the higher refined grids. Okay, but then as you get up in Rayleigh number, it begins to get worse and worse. Okay, so for really number of 500,000, the 8 by 8 grid is clearly not refined enough, and so you're getting values that are what 80, 90 percent from the better refined results. Okay, so this shows you that depending on your problem, depending on the Rayleigh number that you're looking at, or depending on uh, other parameters that you're looking at, you may need to refine your solution more. And the way that you can tell if your solution is approaching the, you know, the correct solution is if you increase the resolution, you know, you get finer and finer resolution, 
and your solution is converging to a single value. You know, clearly, at around Rayleigh 4000, increasing the resolution is barely changing the Nusselt number that we get. Whereas up here at 500,000, I'm not even sure that this, you know, what is it, uh, refinement level five, I don't even know if that's exactly correct yet. You know, we should. Are you sure those aren't switched? No. Four and five? No. Yeah. So four is too high even here. I, um, I, well, these are these are my numbers, so I I ran it out pretty long, but no, it's it's possible. And then just to to throw in another graph, so these are the same values, plotted and fitted. Um, and you can see, you know, you calculate the correlation coefficient, um, and refinement level three is very clearly not fitting a curve, whereas refinement level five is getting very close to fitting the curve that you expect. Okay. So this is just a short example of how you can use aspect to look at a simple problem like this, but it's being used for a whole range of other problems. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and embarrass people. Uh, can all the people using aspect like just quickly stand up and tell us what you're doing with it, just so everyone has an idea of what it can do? Ian, well, you're, what are you not doing with aspect? Might be easier. <laughs> uh, I, I'm using aspect to look at uh, true polar wander problems and coupling mantle convection with Earth's, rot Earth's rotation. Okay. Well, I'm using aspect to evaluate the interplay between surface motions and the uh, mantle convection. So I prescribe surface velocities, as you mentioned, uh, as we have today or as mm -hmm. might have been in the past and uh, look at how this influences the convection patterns. And I use aspect to model mantle plume, so I, I look at uh, if I have a different composition, compositional material in the mantle plume, how this will change the buoyancy and the dynamics of the mantle plume. And I guess we will have the poster session in this afternoon, and then you can see what we do. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And one more. Katrina. I'm Katrina. <laughs> Hi. I work on um, subduction zone models, so I look at the effect of phase transitions and also the different approximations that we were looking at yesterday on the, and their effect on the behavior of the slab. Okay, so are there any last minute questions? Do we get a badge or a certificate? Oh, I should have. Yes, you all, well, you you all the, are now geodynamicists. Can, yeah, you can keep the little USB stick. It's, it's your door prize. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Probably it's, it depends on domain. Um, anywhere from about one, one fourth to one third is <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, no, this is this is roughly right, about 0.3, yeah. Okay, so thank you, everyone. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask either of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm.